So we, last week we did dialect and sociocultural kind of work. Um, same feel, but now coming back to um, categories. Okay. So we're going to talk about register variation. Um, register variation is kind of a newer, or maybe not newer, but a different term for dialect. Um, and uh, a little more on the cultural norms. So the interesting thing about uh, all of this work is that it has to definitely be situated in, in the language itself. And remember how we talked about you can't distinguish sometimes language and culture. Right? Because many people see uh, language as an extension of culture. It's shaped by cultural norms. I, I think you can see that now with um, with the way that we use text speech as regular speech. So I heard my mom say like AF the other day and I was like, wow, <laughs> this whole like text speech has like morphed LOL, right? It morphed into to cultural um, awareness. And uh, there are specific phrases for certain cultures, that kind of thing. So you can't distinguish the two. So sometimes this is called register variation. Okay. Traditionally, register is considered pitch tone, but in this case, we're using it as like the language um, of normal use. Okay. We're going to use the Luke software for the assignment. Um, my small humble brag is that one of my former students um, uh, worked on the newest version of this. And so uh, it's a software that's put together by a pen and baker, UT Austin, and uh, calculates a lot of these kind of like categorical variables. So for the assignment, you will look at those and see if you can group them together. And so let's get into register. Okay, so it's it's not it's not meant to be like culture. Like Black English vernacular that we talked about last week is definitely a, a label for a subset of English, right? Register is a little bit more broad. It's a language variety um, associated with the, the, the kind of, what's the word, pragmatic use of the language, right? So we say, like, if you go to church, you're going to talk differently than if you're at a bar, okay? And so we might distinguish that as email versus face-to-face -face and Twitter. So there are these different places that we use different languages not literal language, different speech patterns, typing patterns. Okay. So these are all context-based factors. Um, last week we were talking more about like internalized cultural factors. Okay. So it might be based on the channel. Speaking, I, I, I talk very differently than when I write. Um, and I spend a lot of time on Twitter because uh, that's kind of where academic science sometimes happens. And that medium obviously forces you to write much differently than speaking. Okay. Uh, the relationship between participants, so your, the emails that I send you guys are a little more formal than I send some of my long-term uh, uh, academic partners and definitely different from the ones I send to my family. Right. So status plays a lot into this. Purpose of the communication. It might be social. It might be more formal, like this. It's transfer of information, um, and then the data set to go use for the uh, assignment is a political data set that you can also use for the final project if you're interested, because there's a lot of things that you can do with it. But it's this idea that that's a very formal transfer of information. So when politicians give speeches on the floor in the U.S. anyway. Um, Often they're not speaking to anyone. <laughs> so if you're if you're ever bored watching like C-SPAN and you see someone up there like blah blah blah, the reason they don't show you the back of the room is because a lot of times there's never anybody there. But they'll they'll log these speeches so they can say that to their constituents that they did it. Okay. Unlike today, kind of big Mueller thing going on today, um, there were a lot of people there at that one. So sometimes it's more of a debate and sometimes it's more of just them talking to themselves. Um, the setting, it could be private or it could be public. Okay. So all of these are just some of the examples of things that affect the way we speak that aren't necessarily tied to your perception of identity. That was more last week. Okay. And they can also be related to specific linguistic features. So 
uh, the kind of the way that we can investigate these is through the use of the, the words that are in those different contexts. Right, so we can see the different patterns. Okay. So this is kind of a, a, a bigger take on some of that DCA stuff we did earlier in the semester. Okay. And there's a special place in the world for pronouns. Okay. Um, there's a book by Pennebaker called The Secret Life of Pronouns that's really great. They do a lot of interesting things. I think we're kind of more culturally aware of pronouns because of the kind of like gender identity questions going on um, right now. But if, even if we ignore all of that kind of stuff, uh, pronouns hold a special status, if you will. Often they're considered stop words, so you remove them, but they actually do some interesting things. Um, so in person, people may use more first-person pronouns than they do in email. Okay. I have trouble with first-person pronouns in email if you have emails to five or six people because it's not clear who you're talking to, right? So I'm going to use more names in that sort of scenario. Um, and we can use clustering kinds of analyses. Not, we're not going to do literal clustering. We've already done that. But analyses that allow us to group to understand the differences in these conversations and sort of give them labels. This allows us to do this without coding it. Okay. So if you take in 520, kind of learn a little bit about um, classification scenarios, this might be a way for us to classify that is not naive based or logistic regression or max entropy, right? So there are, um, this would be a way to calculate a classification scheme as well. That's all I'm trying to say. Okay. So some work, early work by, I guess it's Bieber, Bieber, I'm not totally sure. I hate to say Bieber, right? <laughs> but um, <clears throat> so I'm doing some work on using factor analysis. We're going to talk about factor analysis today. Analyzing conversations for those differences in register variation, those differences in social words based on context, uh, social context. And he was able to show these kind of different dimensions, such as uh, a more informal production, um, you know, kind of your casual conversation versus a more kind of involved, meaning um, put on a show, so to speak, production. Uh, narrative versus non-narrative context. So lectures are non-narrative. Narrative is more telling a story of maybe how, how was your day? You call your mom. How was your day? Just spends 20 minutes talking about tile. My current day. <laughs> it was more like 45 minutes. But that idea of like it was more of a of a narrative of her telling me all about this situation that they have with their kitchen tile. Right. <clears throat> um, and then several other dimensions, but kind of the big two were if it was involved or informal or narrative and not narrative. Okay. If we're only going to go with two dimensions, we probably could do a multidimensional scale. Because we talked about those being a good way to group items in low dimensional space. Okay. Um, but remember, the, the problem, this isn't a problem. Um, disadvantage of multidimensional scaling is that you can't tell the item's relationship with its dimension, you can just see where it is in space. The pro to EFA or PCA is that you can get a weight for the item's relationship to each dimension or factor component. Um, and none of these things are distinct, right? So I could have a uh, what would normally be considered a formal context that I put in I have a social status with people. So for example, uh, I was recently at my big conference. Okay, it was amazing. Um, and it does have this sort of formal context of it, like it's a, it's a conference and workshops or whatever. But it's with a lot of people that I know. Right? So the so this kind of social status is all kind of even. We're friendly, you know, we're not like friends, but we're colleagues. So um, I would say it was very informal. Uh, even though in context it should have been um, very uh, involved, so to speak, but definitely non-narrative because we're talking about research right, and not about our lives. Um, and that overlap is sometimes problematic, sometimes not. So you can define these different scenarios um, 
but they sort of generalized categories of, of situation and status still kind of remain, right? even if you can somehow make them separate. Right? The nice thing about EFA and PCA is they allow you to correlate between situations or between factors, so I can actually kind of control for the fact that these registers overlap. Um, and sometimes people call it genre, style, jargon. It's a really popular one. Uh, and a little bit of dialect, word choice, um, based on situation, not based on identity. Okay. I say people tend to use dialect more as an identity marker, and uh, register variation research tends to be more on context markers. Obviously, those two things are not totally separate, but that's kind of why there's two different areas that seem to do the same thing. I re learned this as pragmatics. Um, so when I didn't learn it as register variation until later because I came at this from psychology, not from linguistics. Very different things sometimes. I really like the phrase pragmatics. It's the social use of language. Um, and so if we define pragmatic as the best idea right given the context, it's the best language given the context. Um, so we might consider register as a rank of formality. Okay? Sometimes that's called tenor, um, meaning that there are situations in which language is more constrained because they're more formal, and then there are situations in which language is more loose because it's less formal. Okay? Um, pragmatics are often applied to social situations, so we could say things are frozen. Okay? So there are some texts that don't change. Um, so formal texts like the Pledge of Allegiance, most um, religious texts don't change. You know, it's kind of arguments over translations, but the text itself doesn't generally tend to change. Um, books are fairly frozen. So these are not really formal or informal. They're just static. Uh, a very formal situation uh, would be more of a non-narrative context where we're delivering technical knowledge, so like a conference presentation, class is somewhere here in the middle, um, or uh, sometimes meetings are very formal. And this is usually just one way. Uh, consultative is two-way conversations, so one would hope that, you know, student-teacher, you're kind of conversing back and forth, it tends to lean a little more formal because I'm doing most of the talking, but um, it could be more of a conversation. Meetings are often kind of a, a little more of a conversation. Depends on how um, how stiff I would say some people are about I'm running this meeting, don't talk, right? Um, so these are situations that are still pretty formal, but the flow of information is back and forth. And then casual, right? So these are conversations you have with a friend, this is social settings, this is slang, this is kind of where the internet fits. Okay. Um, but then there's a question of like, when you're tweeting, are you tr having a conversation? Is it one way? Is it multi-way? Okay. Uh, and so that's why I said this conference is really odd because in theory, it's formal. <laughs> but in practice, it's, it runs pretty casual. Okay. And then you have intimate. These are friends, family, um, any kind of body language. This is mostly non-public communication. Um, although with the advent of the internet, this kind of bleeds a little bit. Um, or you'll see what would normally be considered an intimate conversation like on Instagram or something. Um, and so you can see how these kind of ebb and flow in their formality, but they clearly there's kind of a nice structure to them. <clears throat> So what we'll try to do is analyze the British National Corpus. It has been coded for um, a bunch of things, but 11 different variables. We have 69 observations in it with 11 variables. Okay. And it's been coded for things like um, uh, number of common nouns. So these are, are uh, you know, the top 100 nouns. How many of them are there? Uh, frequencies of third the press, frequencies of present tense verbs. I'm not sure if it's meant to be third person verbs or not. We'll just say present tense verbs. 
Uh, P1 is first person pronouns, conjunction coordinators. These are ands, buts, that kind of thing. So we're coding the uh, speeches or the things in British National Corpus for um, the types of words that they're using. So if we load that bad boy up, we're going to use the psych library as well. Um, we have got what register it technically is in, spoken, academic, magazine. We've used this data set before. The uh, percent of common nouns, proper nouns, present tense, past tense, uh, first person pronouns, second person pronouns, adjectives, coordinated conjunctions, coordinated subjects, and interjections. Okay. The data that you'll get for the, the this project is very similar to this idea, except it has way more columns. <laughs> So I've coded using the Luke, um, um, something like a thousand political speeches for all these different possible um, register variations. All right. So a quick note on this distinction because we're going to get into uh, the book chapters mostly about PCA. And there's some stuff in there I don't totally agree with, so we're going to also really talk about EFA and uh, talk about their pros and cons. Okay. The, one of the big distinctions for principal components analysis, which is PCA, is that components, the, the pieces that you get out of it, the kind of dimensions, are orthogonal. Okay. And these are uncorrelated with each other. Okay. They're linear combinations, so everything we're going to do is kind of create these like linear regression equations that um, uh, uh, represent our different dimensions. And what it does is it creates these combinations of the variables that maximizes capturing all of the variants. So if I have all the variants in a bucket, PCA is pulling out pieces of variance okay, and doling it out such that variance is only used once, so it's uncorrelated or orthogonal, and it's using as much as it can. EFA, huh, no, oh, well, EFA are still linear combinations okay, that takes the variance and looks at how it overlaps. So here's item one, here's item two, here's item three, how much they overlap. And it allows you to correlate the variances. Okay. In language, nothing is uncorrelated. <laughs> so um, one pro to using EFA on a language-based analysis is that uh, we know that the, these different situations or these different pieces are often correlated, so it allows us to handle that. Okay. PCA is really useful if you want distinct solutions. Right? I do not want these things to overlap. And sometimes that might be the goal. Uh, in my own work, that's never really useful, but there are definitely places when you're doing um, maybe categorization that's going to be very useful. Um, EFA is more often used when you want to identify this kind of latent variable. So there's a whole set of analyses called latent variable analysis or structural equation modeling. EFA is kind of like the linear gateway into those. Um, and so it allows me to find these dimensions. And so sometimes they're called uh, latent factors. Okay. Latent just means I didn't actually measure it directly. So, kind of the steps to one of these analyses. Okay, this is um, one of my specialties, so I have like a checklist going for this. Um, you will start by checking some things. Okay, there are certain, like uh, data screening also still applies here, but there are certain sort of rules, things that you should look at before you run any of these types of analyses to make sure you have an appropriate data set. Okay. Then the second step is how many factors or components should I use? How many are there? Okay. Third, day, third point is simple structure, or kind of creating a model that best represents the data. And last is this, is this an adequate solution? Does the, is the answer I have work? Okay. So we'll walk through each one of these steps one at a time and talk about what you should do at each one of those. Step one, before you start, you should check your correlations. Um, and this is very similar to that cluster thing we did when we built the distances, when we looked at them, and we didn't want the one that's super crazy. Uh, kind of the same idea. So 
Uh, in both of these analyses, PCA or EFA, uh, the items that you are running this on have to be correlated. That is the entire point of the analysis. <laughs> in PCA, it's like clustering the correlations together and creating these orthogonal uh, variance points. In EFA, it's clustering them together. Um, it's not really literally clustering, like cluster analysis is kind of grouping. Um, grouping together the ones that are the most correlated, and um, if they're not correlated, this analysis is not worth your time. Okay. So we can look at the correlations on our items by using cortest.bartlett. This is in the psych package. The other interesting question is sampling adequacy, and this is the kaiser meiger olkin statistic. And um, <clears throat> ooh, wrong button. the uh, sampling adequacy is this question of having enough variance in the item to kind of support the analysis. So it can't just look at the variance on the item. It's kind of like, do I have enough participants and enough variance for this to work? That's the way I think about it. You need at least three or four items per grouping. That's per factor or per component. So if you're running this on a 10 or 11 um, items here, we really can't get more than three or four factors. Uh, I try to see people all the time put like one or two things on there, and that's just no good. That's like bad science. Um, if you're indicating that a factor is one variable, all you're really saying is that that is, you know, there's one variable. Um, two is kind of iffy. Three is really where you start to have a consensus, a cluster, if you will. Uh, for both of these, the data needs to be at least interval measurements. We're going to use proportions. Proportions are ratio scale, zero to one. And then it has all the normal parametric assumptions. The data needs to be normal, linear, homogeneic. There's one more. Almost get ASIC. And the other one that I've got. <clears throat> so let's check those correlations. So what I did here was I just saved them as correlations, used the core function. And I did minus one because the first column in this particular data set is the um, the register, right? Spoken, whatever. You can't run a correlation on that, it will uh, blow up because it's a factor. Then I st stick my correlations in this cortest.bartlett. I say how many rows there are, so I tell it how many data points we're sampling. So I just did in row, count them up. Okay. And this test will almost always be significant. I have maybe seen it once where it wasn't. It's very sensitive to sample size. So a significant test implies that the data has large enough correlations for an EFA or PCA to be appropriate. Okay. So this essentially tests if the correlation matrix is different from zero. Okay. With larger sample sizes, almost any correlation is different from zero. So this is a good low pass filter, okay. meaning like, well, probably good enough. <clears throat> Let's look at KMO now. Um, it compares a ratio between R squared and PR squared. So how much variance can I account for by taking one item and producing it with every other item? And how much variance, um, so R squared, and then how much variance does that item account for on all the other ones? Um, scores closer to one are better. That means that the variance is being um, used in the analysis at, a, at the right rate. The, the, the variance isn't unique, right? So this one item isn't sort of totally out left field. Okay. Things that are close to zero are pretty bad. It means you don't have enough variance that overlaps with other variances. Right? Or maybe you don't have enough people. Um, because if you don't have enough people, right, uh, variance can be either really wild or really tiny. So we run that as well on our correlations. This is not good. <laughs> Do I have the rules for it? No, I don't. So um, you want these to be very high, close to one. 
I think 0.7 is kind of the like lower bound rule. 0.8 is good, 0.9 is really good, and so once you start getting below 0.7, I, um, most of these are bad, so these are pretty, you know, not excellent. So, especially past tense verbs here, and numbers, coordinating conjunctions. It might be, I can look at those and tell that there's just not enough variance at all. So let me go back. Let me just hit this button so we get everything. Uh, let's see if I can remember. Uh, my brain today, it's on vacation still <laughs> from last week. All right, let's try this. So we would do, yeah, 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 apply. Oh, no, we can use psych. I love psych's describe function. Um, maybe not that big. And let's do our data set, which is reg B and C. Now, it does star things that are factors, so we really wouldn't want to look at that, but it does give you standard deviation. So the nice thing about um, describe is that it gives you standard deviation right away in the min, the max. Um, it doesn't give you interquartile range. Some read as though. Uh, it would be better if it also gave you that, because then I would never have to use summary, but that's a different story. So I could look here at the variances for them. Here are standard deviations, and they're actually all very small. So some of these are probably pretty are problematic because the variances are kind of small. Um, small variances in a problem, except when you have floor effects. Okay. So what do we say? Number was bad. Was a really bad one. Number of v passed. Let's look at that one. V passed. Okay. So the percent of time that people are using past tense verbs is three. Right. This is a, sm a small pr proportion, and there it's almost no variance. And so that would be difficult to find it correlating with other items when there's, it's all floor effects. Okay. So that's kind of usually what I look for when I have numbers that are this bad. Okay. Um, now, I will leave them in the analysis and see what happens. So I wouldn't, ex I wouldn't exclude them, but if all of your numbers are very low, it probably tells you you're not going to get a whole lot from this analysis. All right, so the next question is, how many factors or components do I have? So how, what do I run, right? The whole purpose of this analysis is to create dimensions. How many should I, should I do? Because I have to pick, right? I could run one to n, but um, <clears throat> that just seems silly. So what, what is the optimal number to run? This could be based on theory. Most of my work in this area is on scale development and psychometrics, so generally people develop questionnaires with a theory on how many factors or components there should be underlying it. doesn't always work, but generally there's theory. Here I don't really have a good theory. Maybe there's four. Narrative, non-narrative, uh, uh, informal, and involved. You can also use the Kaiser criterion. This is kind of going out of style, but people still do it. Um, where you want your eigenvalues, which we've talked about several times. Remember, it's a representation of variance to be over 1 or maybe over 0.7. Depends on who you talk to. Uh, biggest deal is to look at scree plots. We've looked at those before and run a parallel analysis. So let's look at those. I skipped theory because I don't have a theory. For Kaiser, the old rule was to extract. When you extract, this is how many dimensions you run. Um, the number of eigenvalues over 1. Okay. So newer research suggests that maybe we should do 0.7. I find both of these to be often too many, so they estimate too high. Okay. We've actually talked about this, but a reminder, an eigenvalue is a mathematical representation of the variance accounted for by creating that dimension or that grouping. Um, a screen plot, am I going to show you? I think I'm just going to talk and then show you the numbers. So a screen plot, remember, is a, a plot of those eigenvalues. So across the bottom here, we'll get 11 because we have 11 variables. And you're looking for the screen or the elbow in the plot where it levels out. 
So over here on the left, we've got one, and then it levels out. And we've got two, one, two, and then it levels out. Okay, so remember, you're looking for the elbow, where it stops. Where If I threw a ball down a hill, this is where it would stop rolling. Well, okay, in reality, it would keep rolling, but the idea is that this is where the, the drop stops. A parallel analysis is a test that tells me how many eigenvalues are greater than chance. So what happens is it calculates the eigenvalues on your actual data, it randomizes that data and recalculates those eigenvalues, then it compares them to determine if they're equal. Okay. So when I run, uh, to run that, what I would do is use the function fa.parallel, so this is factor analysis.parallel. Um, don't let this confuse you, the psych package treats PCA is a special type of factor analysis, which I don't know that everyone agrees with, but um, almost everything can be run through the FA function. First argument is the data set. The second argument is the factor math, which I'll get to in just a minute, but we're going to stick with maximum likelihood right now. And then the type of analysis, I put both so you could see principal components and EFA. You can switch this to do just EFA or just PCA by changing the text here to PCA or EFA. Um, I only do both because we're talking about both types of analyses. I would normally pick, pick one and stick with it. Um, do I have the picture bigger? No. Okay. So when you look at the picture, what you get here is the Kaiser criterion. That's with a one line here. It does not change. It's not representative of the scree. So let me see if I can make this picture bigger. We're going to create some cool pictures today. There it is. That's a little better. So this is just the Kaiser criterion, so I can kind of ignore that temporarily. Um, remember the PCA and EFA are different mathematically. One controls for total variance, one controls for uh, shared variance, so the two eigenvalue calculations are different. So PCA is here, these X's. If I look at this plot and think about the scree, I could probably say it's like one. I might interpret these two as a little extra before it totally flattens. Um, so I would say maybe one or three. Remember interpretive dance. The EFA one is clearly either one or two. Um, the simulated and resampled data lines almost never are different. So you actually usually can't see that there are two different lines here because they're so similar. So remember this takes your data and mixes it up. And then you look for where those lines cross. And in the output, it doesn't really print this in a good way on the slides. It just tells you. Parallel analysis suggests that there are three factors or two components. And that's where it crosses the line here. So for the components, it says that there's at least two ab above where they cross. For factor analysis, there's three above because it crosses back here. One, two, three above that. If I look at the Kaiser criterion, I can see that there are two eigenvalues, or FA values, over 1, or still 2 over 0.7. So I'm going to get a pretty solid 2 here. Right. So the principal components suggested 2. The EFA said 3, but I could probably see it being 2. This is 2. 2 sounds like a good number. And that brings us to step 3. So simple structure, this is going to vary a lot by the goal of your analysis. But the idea of simple structure is that there uh, is a math that you want to use. Okay. So principal components analysis, most people use principal components math. This is very confusing, <laughs> personally. But uh, that's usually the type of math that you want to uh, apply to extract your dimensions. For EFA, the most common thing to use is maximum likelihood. And this is the, the, the 
there's a lot involved here, but this is the way that it makes the dimensions, the linear regressions that show us how each item is related to its dimension. Um, this is the mathematical choice for which type of analysis you want to run. Okay. Don't do an EFA and tell it to do principal components math. It will let you do this in psych, because then if you tell it to run an EFA on principal components math, it will give you a principal components analysis. Okay. So don't mix and match, because then it's not clear what your results should be. <clears throat> All right, for EFA only, because we allow things to correlate, what you will do is also choose a rotation. Okay. The rotation is how you're going to take your linear regression equations and turn them, so to speak, so that they best fit the data. So it increases the relationship between each item and its um, dimension. It also aids in interpretation because it allows you to, to create a more sensitive picture of your analysis. I'm going to show you a picture of this. So let's stole this from the Andy Field book. Um, on the left here is an orthogonal rotation, which essentially makes PCA and EFA very similar. Okay, this is uncorrelated um, dimensions. And so pretend like these red line, these black lines are the original uh, linear regression equations. Okay. In two dimensions, we can kind of think of this like multidimensional scaling. Okay. Um, and an orthogonal rotation forces them to stay at 90 degrees so that they're orthogonal, they do not uh, share variances. And so when you rotate them, they have to stay at 90 degrees. When that happens, that means that often you can capture the variance of one of them good, uh, down here probably, and one of them maybe not so good. But the nice thing about this interpretation-wise is they're distinct dimensions. They do not overlap. The problem with that in a, in a language context is I just, <laughs> I can't think of a scenario that I wouldn't think that something was correlated linguistically. On the right side here, what we can see is an oblique rotation. This is specific EFA magic. Oblique rotations allow the factors to be correlated, so their regression equations can have essentially correlated error. And um, maybe this picture isn't done the best, but you can uh, rotate your equations so that it captures the items much, groupings much better. Okay. Uh, the nice thing about an oblique rotation is if the data is truly uncorrelated, do I have that on the slide? Probably. No, that's this answer here. So the answer to the last bullet point here is if the data is truly uncorrelated, an oblique rotation will become orthogonal. Okay. So personally, I don't ever see a reason to run an orthogonal PCA or EFA because if the data is orthogonal, oblique rotation will handle it. Uh, often, in my scenarios, the data is not orthogonal, so I might as well know that, so to speak. Uh, I can see scenarios where you might want something to be orthogonal, though, in, more, in other contexts. All right, so um, some examples of some orthogonal rotations that you can put in are Verimax, Quartermax, Equimax, Verimax being the most popular. Oblique options are Oblomen, that's definitely the most popular, or sometimes called Direct Oblomen, and Promax. Unfortunately, the word Max does not imply orthogonal rotations. So as I'm doing that, because so I can see my screen, <clears throat> once I've made these two decisions, I will program it in to run. Okay. Once it runs, I get an output. Okay. That output we're going to call is a loadings table. Okay. And by loadings, we essentially mean the, uh, the relationship of that item to its dimension. Okay. And these are generally called loadings. They're, uh, they can go over one. They usually don't. Okay. And they can be negative. Okay. Uh, but it's, it's, it's not a correlation. It's, it's a regression weight between an item and its factor or component. I'm just going to use the word dimension to mean either one. Uh, you want these to be at least a point of three. 
So if we think about this in a correlational standpoint, because most of the time these run from negative 1 to 1, it's not perfect, but most of the time they do, a, a medium-sized correlation is 0.3. And so you want items to be related to their dimension at point three for you to interpret them on that dimension. Okay. So let's say I'm looking at a, a questionnaire. Most, most of you guys have probably heard of the big five. It's a big, uh, really common um, personality scale where it's got openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, a agreeableness, and neuroticism has changed names because People don't like being called neurotic because <laughs> I spell ocean the way I learned it, right? So to interpret that a question is an open question, it would need to load or be related to its factor with at least 0.3. Okay. And this just allows you to see which ones go where. Uh, okay, that's about 10% of the variance of the of the item. And we can eliminate items that load poorly. So coming at this from a scale development perspective, often what I'm trying to do is eliminate questions that don't work. Right? So a uh, project I'm finishing now is we are developing a scale that measures um, uh, response to treatment in migraines. Okay? We started with like 200 questions and we ended with nine. Okay? To get to that point, um, what we did was we ran a factor analysis and eliminated all the questions that just didn't load at all. They weren't related to a dimension that we were interested in. They didn't have a correlation of at least, or a, a loading of at least 0.3. Okay. Then we did some other things to it to get down to 9, but that's where we started. So the uh, analysis is iterative. Um, in a scale development scenario, I often don't want items to relate to multiple dimensions. Okay. So uh, in our migraine study, we had, uh, for one of the scales, we had uh, questions about doctors. Uh, so my doctor understands me. I can talk to my doctor. The questions about insurance. My insurance pays for my medications. And a question about education. So I understand my symptoms, my family and friends understand my symptoms, etc. Okay. And I didn't want a question that related to both doctors and, and insurance. I wanted my doctor question to only be related to doctors. Okay. So sometimes you'll see this as loading on one and only one. And that helps us keep things separate even when allowing them to correlate. So doctors and insurance are pretty related things right? <laughs> because they tend to go together. Um, but my question is only for doctors. In an exploratory kind of clustering scenario, I could see where you would let them be related to multiple things. So what we're going to do today is we're going to let them load on more than one dimension because you might have items that represent two different dimensions. Uh, if you're looking at, if you see this later as in a scale sort of development way, what people generally do is they say, if it loads on more than one, get rid of it. Okay. That's how we got from 200 to 9. Um, 9 was the goal. So then we eliminated questions based on their strengths. Okay. All right, so I'm going to start with PCA. The function is principal. Um, because it's principal, it assumes some different things. Uh, so it assumes that you want to do principal components analysis with principal components math. It's a mouthful. You put in the data. You tell it the number of components, but the function is in factors because this is actually a special version of the FA function. And you tell it to rotate equals none. You can actually put in rotations here, but then it stops being principal components analysis. There is no rotating in PCA. All right, I'm going to save that. And then I can look at the loadings. And the nice thing is that um, now do know that the psych package was developed by a psychologist. <laughs> so it does follow these rules that I'm talking about. So it will show you, I don't understand sometimes why, like it'll show me 0.2, but generally it drops the 0.3, anything less than 0.3. Um, but what we want to do is look at the whole output for usefulness purposes. I'm going to zoom out just a little. 
down here to, oh, I can just type PCA, maybe, PCA fit. Yeah. So um, the, this whole thing normally just prints out, but it doesn't fit on a slide. So here we are. What you want to do is look here. Okay. This is a loadings chart. So what we'll see is all of the items and their relationship to their dimension. So dimension one, dimension two. H2 here is communality. It's how much variance is accounted for across those two regression equations. Um, and so items with very low variances are not gonna be very good. Uh, and that will often match your KMO statistic. U2 here is 1 minus variance, it's uh, uniqueness. Complexity is a weird thing, so ignore it. So to interpret this, what I would do is I would look at these and figure out what the pattern is. So in com, in prop, v pres, all load together. Look at what else. P1, P2, adjectives. Like pretty much all of them load on this first component except V past. But some of them are negative and some of them are positive. Okay, so I have to interpret that. It could go through this whole table one piece at a time, or I can make a pretty picture. And this is why I love this section, There's so many pictures. Uh, so I'm just gonna do FA.plot and put in my fit, and then I'm gonna give the labels as colonies. <clears throat> So for principal component one, uh, this essentially gets kind of interpreted like a multidimensional scale. But what we can see is they're color coded by which component they better load with. So let's go back and look here. Right. So income loads better with principal component one because it is higher, closer to one, 0.86 versus 0.4. So let's go back on the chart. So income, if I could see it here, is black. So that's principal component one. Um, then, uh, so these, I think, would be the positive ones. Here are the negative ones, I think, is what's happening. Oh, I said that backwards. The negative ones and then the positive ones. So kind of negative and then positive over here. Because okay, then they're opposite sides. So I could kind of look at these and be like, okay, what's happening here? I also could interpret it in the multidimensional space and be like, these cluster together, these cluster together, and these cluster together. Okay. Not too surprising that interjections and, and pronouns cluster together. Okay. Um, because pronouns, right, first person, third, third per second person, third person pronouns, and interjections are like, hey, right? <clears throat> um, but I still, this picture maybe not best. Let's look at one more. I like this one the most. Okay. This is more of a structural equation model type picture that we might see uh, reported. Now, uh, the bad thing personally here is that it only shows you, just like the last chart, how related it, like which item it's the most related to, or which dimension it's the most related to. It's not like these are very small. So look here. For proper nouns, that's really close. So I would argue that sometimes these analyses may, um, these pictures may hide the fact that this is pretty evenly split between the two. Um, and here it's also pretty close. Right? Sometimes it's really obvious. Like P1 and P2 only relate to principal component 1. They don't even relate to principal component 2 at all. So that kind of hides it. But the nice thing here is that they color code it pretty, pretty nicely. So principal component 1 is more pronouns and interjections and present tense verbs and less common nouns and adjectives. This is definitely more of an informal chatting scenario. You're talking to a friend, um, and you're using, hey, you remember when we did that thing? That kind of stuff. Principal component two is less past tense, okay, less proper nouns, more coordinated conjunctions, and less numbers. Okay. So 
If you have less past tense, that's kind of that means there's something else, right? Generally, present or future tense. And less proper nouns means we're probably using more common nouns. So this, to me, kind of argues a little bit more for a formal, more formal situation. We're talking about maybe business. Here is how things are. And then I could go back here and think about the strengths of these. Okay. So when I say uh, less past tense, it is more present tense as well. And so what you do to interpret these is just look at how they load, and then you just really have to kind of create a story for it. Okay. Explain what each component means, given the way that they've related to that component. An important thing to note here is the direction of the arrows. One of the biggest distinctions um, between PCA and EFA is the math. Right? So one of, one of them allows for correlations, one of them doesn't. But the other one is the theoretical direction of the predictor. Okay? So in PCA, what, ha what, what happens is all of these items are regressed onto the latent variable. This is not a real number in your data set. It is structurally built. And so all of these items are, they create a composite piece component. So they're built such that they are predicting the component. Component is Y. And that's reflected in the direction of the arrows here. EFA is the other way around. We think that that uh, factor, that dimension, is what causes the answers on the items. So when we're talking about things like um, personality, we think a person's personality, their openness to new experiences, is what causes them to answer a specific way on that scale. So the output that you're seeing on your scale or whatever is because of that internal whatever on in the person. Um, so in the language scenario, it would be the situation that this language piece is in is what causes the words to come out. Okay. And we're trying to define those situations. So I might think that EFA is a better representation. Okay. But I could think about it the other way, too. I could say that the words that you are using at me implies that this is very formal. So the words create this situation. So I actually see it both ways. <clears throat> All right, to run an EFA, what we're going to do is switch to the FA function, okay. throw in the data. It's very similar. In factors equals two. Here's something new. Rotate. We're going to go with oblomen. This is an um, oblique rotation that allows us to correlate factors. Before, they're totally uncorrelated, so completely separate situations. Uh, factor math, maximum likelihood. Uh, maximum likelihood just allows us to um, calculate the like distribution of this statistic and pick the most likely one. It's a gross oversimplification of maximum likelihood, but that's the idea. And you can do the same thing where it drops the loadings, but it's going to be much better if we just print it out. Printout looks pretty similar, uh, has more information, but um, here you see ML. So it shows you what kind of math that you did. Up here we said PC. Now the nice thing about rotating is it will increase the strength of the um, stronger factor and decrease the strength of the weaker factor because it allows it to rotate and create these linear equations that best represent the correlation between um, dimensions. So what? And uh, the direction of the of the causality is different, so there, there's a lot of differences, subtle differences. But if we just look at the outputs, you can tell that essentially it has completely, for um, common nouns, completely dropped off of the second dimension here. And for proper nouns, it's completely gone with the the second dimension rather than the first. And that to me is one of the good things about factor analysis. Is it um, tends to kind of capture which one is mo strongest and drop the other one. Okay. Not completely, though. Obviously, we have things like this, where it's an equal split. Okay. Um, 
Here's another one that's good, a good split. So it's not perfect. But I can now come down here and look at the correlation between situations, and it's pretty high, 0.3. And all this other stuff we'll get to in a second. So I can create those same pictures. You'll notice they look a little different, okay. but not so different. These three bad boys still hang out together. So it's kind of what's happened is this picture's kind of turned. Okay, and that's part of the road to hating stuff. Okay. I can also create the same structural picture. Okay. Do you notice the direction of the arrows has gone the other way? Okay. It, it, it rounded these up. They're not actually one, they're just really high. And it shows you the correlation between them. Um, so the underlying link variable causes the answers on these. So the fact that this is an informal situation means the output that you see is more pronouns and interjections and less adjectives and common nouns. The fact that this is a more formal situation means that we're seeing more conjunctions, more present tense, less past tense, and less proper nouns. So I think these are a little bit easier to interpret too. They kind of line up a little better. All right, last step. I've created this picture of the data, this model. Is that picture any good? Because there are no p-values here. Um, so we might use fit indices. Fit indices are a measure of the match of the model to the data. There are two types, broadly. There are goodness of fit statistics. And anytime you see goodness of fit statistics, you want them to be good, closer to one. It's how much the two correlation matrices overlap. So the reproduced correlation matrix is, if here's my model, what does that imply about the relationship between the variables? And then here's the real data, and how, literally, how much they overlap. So the closer to one it is, the better the model fits the data. Uh, badness of fit statistics or residual statistics measure mis <laughs> measure mismatch mismatch measures of the M's. So we want numbers close to zero. So it's a subtraction of the two matrices. Okay. So goodness of fit statistics measure match. Bad fit badness of fit statistics measure mismatch. I almost can do it. <laughs> um, and then how interpretable are they? Okay. So I'm looking at the output, can I make any sense of it? So I think it's really awesome if you asked this question about like about the topics models today, like it doesn't make any sense. That is always a good sign that something's wrong. Okay. If you can't interpret um, the picture of the data you're making, then maybe the model is not a good representation. Now that doesn't mean that it isn't the interpretation you wanted, because that happens. Um, so I was doing a project with some friends, uh, and they were trying to build a scale that had three dimensions. Okay. It took us five tries before we finally got it right. <laughs> so the picture of the data in the first four tries was not what we wanted, um, but it was interpretable. Okay. It just wasn't what we wanted. So those two things are different questions. Okay, so for PCA, we can look at the root mean square of the residuals. Now, all of this is contained in the output. So here's, nope, too far. Here's PCA. Scroll, scroll, scroll. Here's the root mean square of the residuals is 0.11. Um, coming down here, you can also get for EFA, the root mean square of residual. Uh, for EFA, you can get a couple of other ones. So they're all in that long printout but you can also tell it to just print them. Okay. So the root mean square of the residuals, this is a residual statistic, so I want it to be low. This number would normally be considered kind of bad. You want these normally to be below 0.06, okay, or um, at least below 0.10. For EFA, we're getting a little better, it's 0.09. Okay. The root mean squared error of approximation, or rim c some people call this rim r um, although it's kind of weird because it's RMSR. I don't know why. Anyway, so RIMC, uh, we definitely want to be below 0.10, so this is really not good. Okay. Um, so this would indicate a bad fit to the model. Okay. And then it's cut off on the bottom here about the Tucker-Lewis index. 
Sometimes this is called the non-normed fit index. This is a goodness of fit statistic that we want to be very high, and it matches the RIMC and indicating the model's not very good. Okay, we want numbers above 0.9. So see how they're mirrors of each other? Goodness of fit statistics above 0.9 is good. Badness of fit statistics below 0.10 is good. Depending on what field of research you're in, those can get bigger and smaller. Okay, so in the field that I'm in, people want them to be very good, so 0.95 and 0.05. Because for some reason, statisticians are obsessed with 0.05, right? Mm -hmm. It's a magic number. So right now, I'm indicating some bad fit to the model. And what I would do to improve my model is potentially remove some items that are clearly not working. And you can do this on the assignment, too. So I might try removing some that are really particularly not fitting well and for H2, like numbers. This is not doing me a whole lot of good. It does at least load on one of the items, but it's not very good. Right? Um, then I might look at some of these other ones. So here, coordinating conjunctions. Right? It's not being measured very well. V passed. So I can kind of look and see, are there some of these items that are not doing me any favors? Right? And they generally have low H2 values. Sorry. Low KMO statistics. I just don't load very well. And I would definitely remove items that didn't load at all, meaning they don't have a correlation of 0.3 with anything. Okay, that can be pretty normal. All right, now I could go on about EFA and PCA forever, but you don't want me to, so let's do a summary, and then I'll show you the assignment. So we talked about register, and really what we're doing here in creating these dimensions is finding which types of words go with which register. And then that could be used to classify the formality of the language. Um, you learned about how to do that with um, kind of orthogonal components with PCA or latent factors with EFA. We talked about the differences between those two analyses are both mathematical and theoretical. Um, and then you learned kind of the rules on the steps to applying an EFA or PCA. I would not do both. Right. And the assignment is not to do both. Pick one based on your kind of thoughts and feelings about them. And run with it. Okay, and then that's the end of the summary. But we talked about the steps to running, running these guys. And remember that this is very interpretive. So you might run the analysis several times. So in a real situation for this, I might run two factors and three factors. I see which one's better. Because we're not trying to find the um, 0.05 criterion, we're trying to find the best fit to the data. So here's the model that best represents the data that we have. 